What are the metaphors we use to imagine what one from many means and looks like in practice? Those of you familiar with my previous classes and with Professor Joe Bessler's teaching know we both are influenced by Lakoff and Johnson's book, Metaphors We Live By. They said the book really might be titled Metaphors We Live In. For we do, we live, in, we live metaphorically. Our understanding of the world is grown by comparison between what we know and what we encounter today. If you understand politics as war, you will behave quite differently than if you understand politics as a dance or persuasion or a contest with our worthy opponents. In other classes and, and blogs, I've talked about how politics and religion overlap in culture in the realms of story, belonging, moral order, and empowerment. What is the story we tell about ourselves? How do we determine who belongs and who does not? What do we owe each other in a particular group or in the society? What are the obstacles that must be overcome in order to become who we should be? In trying to understand what one from many might mean, we employ metaphors. Those metaphors about how we should be one and many at the same time are not just comparisons and word images. They express and empower that overlap area occupied by religion and politics. Let's play out some of the religio-political dynamics of these metaphors for the one and the many. A bundle of sticks, a bouquet, a melting pot, a mosaic, a city park. But let's also start back a few centuries in European history. Throughout the millennium plus of the Constantinian establishment, Europe was officially Christian. Non-Christians were sometimes tolerated, sometimes persecuted minorities. There was no wall of separation and sometimes not even a veil between church and state. One could take the Apostle Paul's metaphor of the church's body of Christ and apply it to the regions of the empire. The empire was the body, and the church was the body. Here's that parcel passage from 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If one suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. But then in the late 1400s through the 1500s, along comes the Protestant Reformation. The Holy Roman Empire breaks up and local rulers operated by the principle Whoever rules determines the religion. The body of Christ could no longer hold Europe together or even its constituent parts. What might? Teresa Bejan wrote a brilliant book on the subject of unity after Christendom called Mere Civility. When the public moral order or foundational story can no longer appeal to Christian scripture for its foundation, one cannot appeal to the body of Christ metaphor for social unity what might function as the vinculum societas, a tie. Bejan's book is on the very different understandings of civility to attempt to be that tie, but that is another class. So let's move on. Start with the metaphor of a bundle of arrows or sticks. The metaphor is known in Native American and African cultures. We see that story, that metaphor portrayed in the eagle's claw on US currency, that claw full of arrows. Person cannot, uh, a person, excuse me, a person can break a stick. Two sticks, harder. A dozen sticks, maybe not at all. Rabbi Mark Gelman gave a, a powerful address in Yankee Stadium gathering after 9-11 on the need for Americans to be that bundle of sticks. These were his words. The real horror of that day lies not in its bigness, but in its smallness in the small, searing death of one person 6,000 times. And that one person was not a number. 
that person was our father or our mother or son or daughter or grandpa or grandma or brother or sister or cousin or uncle or aunt or friend or lover, our neighbor, our coworker, the woman who delivered our mail or the guy who put out our fires and arrested the bad guys in our town. And the death of each and every one of them alone would be worthy of such a gathering and such a grief. Our sages taught that when one kills a single person, it is like killing the whole world altogether. And when one saves a single person, it's like saving the whole world altogether. Last week, over 6,000 worlds were killed, and thank the Lord, a few, far too few words were saved by heroes, but were saved by heroes, most of whom will never be known. The dimensions of last week's horror only become fully drawn when we enter each murdered world one world at a time. The Talmud and the African tribe, the Maasai tribe, both teach a wisdom for our wounded world. They both taught sticks alone can be broken by a child, but sticks in a bundle are unbreakable. The fears and sorrows of this moment are so heavy. They can break us if we try to bear them alone, but if we are bundled together, if we stick together, we are unbreakable. And we shall do far more than merely survive. We shall overcome. We shall overcome the forces of hatred without allowing hatred to unbundle us. We shall overcome the forces of terror without using fear to unbundle us. So in all our comings and our goings from this time forth, let us remember that the person next to you, in front of you, behind you, is not merely an obstacle to your free and unfettered life. They are part of this bundle that keeps you and each of us from breaking. Let us never again, you, our fellow New Yorkers, our fellow Americans, our fellow citizens of the world, as limitations on our freedom or life, but rather as the moral twine that binds up and saves and delivers us from evil. For some of us, the source of that strength, the twine that binds and holds us is not just community, but community under God. But I wanna say for those who cannot find hope through your faith, I say to you that you also are a part of the bundle. For the important task in our spiritual journey now is not for all of us to agree the name for hope is God. The main task now is to agree that hope was not one of the worlds destroyed on that day. That day when 6,000 people did not die, but the day when one person died 6,000 times. The bundle of sticks or arrows tells a story of the danger of trying to go it alone in a world of conflict and hostility and adversity. We must live in a bundle in order to thrive. We must recognize our connections to each other, a common humanity. And everyone who wants to abide in the bundle belongs. The metaphor of a bouquet. I will address this one briefly. The bouquet was the very first picture to accompany E Pluribus Unum. The phrase and the bouquet were published in the Gentleman's Magazine in the American colonial era. A bouquet is flowers gathered together. It can be lovely. It can smell good. It can include lots of different flowers, together more beautiful and more interesting than any one of them. For an aesthetic metaphor, the bouquet is great. For endurance over time and in the face of adversity, one does not picture a bouquet. A nation is not a bouquet. A melting pot. If, you, if you've never read the play The Melting Pot and you care about what kind of nation, what kind of moral community the United States should be, I encourage you to read it. Thanks to the Gutenberg Project, the play is available free and online, and I'll put that link in the Mighty Networks. For many years, I dismissed the metaphor of America's melting pot. I knew the idea gained cultural currency due to Israel Zangwill's 1908 play of the same name. But I had no idea of the content of that play until recently reading Yasha Monk's book, The Great Experiment, why diverse democracies fall apart and how they can endure. His work encouraged me to find the play and read it. I hope you'll, you'll do the same. I've linked to it again on our Mighty Networks page. The plot tells of a Jewish Russian refugee, David, who is writing a symphony called The Crucible, in which he envisions America as a great refining pot 
in which representative members of the human race stream. One of the problems of Zangwill's play is the near absence of Americans from anywhere but Europe. Critics of the play rightly say that not everyone's invited into the melting. Does the metaphor also apply to Native Americans and Black Americans? The historical evidence would say no, but please read on and judge for yourself whether or not the metaphor might work. Well, David and Vera, a Russian Christian immigrant, fall in love. But when the lovers discover that Vera's father is responsible for the pogrom back in Russia, during which David's family was slaughtered, their love and David's conception of what America is are threatened by this revelation. Nevertheless, Vera encourages David to finish his symphony, to realize his vision in music. The play closes with the sun rising on the city, the protagonists kissing and pledging their love, and the audience cheering wildly. Schlocky, right? Yes. Yeah, but it's more than that. Before reading the play, I thought of melting pot as a cooking kettle for creating a lovely stew, gently simmering. Or maybe the pot is like a fondue pot and the restaurant chain of the same name as the play. However, the pot Zangwill envisioned is not a nice heirloom cast iron kettle simmering on low or a fondue pot bubbling atop a low sterno flame. The pot is a crucible, as the symphony of David is trying to write is named. The melting pot, the smelting pot, the crucible, is for subjecting the contents to heat sufficient to separate ore from pure metal. This is a refiner's fire. In the play, David proclaims, America is God's crucible, the great melting pot where all of the races of Europe are melting and reforming. Here you stand, good folk, think I, when I see them at Ellis Island. Here you stand in your 50 groups with your 50 languages and histories and your 50 blood hatreds and rivalries. But you won't be long like that, brothers, for these are the fires of God you've come to. These are the fires of God, a fig tree for your feuds and vendettas. Germans and Frenchmen, Irishmen and Englishmen, Jews and Russians, into the crucible with you all. God is making the American. Hear the concern in that for leaving the feuds and hatreds of the old country behind. Becoming an American, Zangwill is saying, requires smelting out the hate. Zangwill is offering a difficult moral understanding of what it means to be an American that is not about losing one's culture. He further says that you are Euro-Americans are now in the crucible rather than in their finished form. God's not done making the American. The heat is on. So to come to America means to submit oneself to God's intense refiner's fire. One does not exit the crucible with the same composition one had upon entering. Each must be made new. Is any of that sounding religious to you yet? And then comes, at the close of the play, the sun rises, David looks to the light and prophesies, a word I'm borrowing from the stage directions there, that he says, it is the fires of God round his crucible. <clears throat> and there she lies, the great melting pot. Listen, can't you hear the roaring and the bubbling? There gapes her mouth, the harbor, where a thousand mammoth feeders come from the ends of the world to pour in their human freight. Ah, what a stirring and a seething. Celt and Latin, Slav and Teuton, Greek and Syrian, black and yellow. Oh yeah, finally, but still not read in the mind of the New York-oriented European immigrant. And his girlfriend Vera saying, Jew and Gentile, David back. Yes, east and west and north and south, the palm and pine, the pole in the equator, the crescent and the cross, how the great alchemist melts and fuses them with his purging flame. Here shall they all unite to build the Republic of Man and the Kingdom of God. Ah, Vera, what is the glory of Rome and Jerusalem where all nations and races came to worship and look back? Compared with the glory of America where all races and nations come to labor and look forward. And he raises his hands in benediction over the shining city, saying, Peace, peace to all ye unborn millions, fated to fill this giant continent. The God of our children give you peace. The Republic of Man, Humankind, and the Kingdom of God, looking forward rather than backwards, Engel's vision is fundamentally religious, resonating with the social gospel aspirations and ideas of his day. 
So Zhang Mo's metaphor is not oriented towards blending everyone together into a stew in which one cannot taste the difference between a potato and a carrot. The melting pot is a refiner's fire, lit to smelt out feuds and hatred of the other. It is the place of the divine alchemist's work to create a nation gathered from around the globe that will be smelted, not melted, together. Extrapolating from Zangwill's metaphor, we might say, America is the place where people from all over the planet can live well together, but the harmony requires the difficult work of submitting yourself to being smelted, to refining out the hatred caused in the past, to give up old world loyalties. You must orient to looking forward to labor towards a better future for everyone. Then there's the mosaic. When I wrote a blog reflecting on Zengmul's metaphor of the melting pot, many respondents said they preferred the metaphor of mosaic or salad bowl. America is a multicultural mosaic, this goes. Many, many pieces of different colors and materials and shapes laid into patterns that could form one huge beautiful picture or many pictures or simply a wonderful randomness. The argued advantage of the mosaic metaphor over the melting pot is that one is asked uh, to surrender identities, uh, not to surrender identities, uh, nor to be melted, melted with others. As I said, I don't think the melting pot quite means what critics ascribe to it. But there's another place where history is important. Some American leaders have disliked the mosaic. They admonished against hyphenated Americans. This cartoon showing now from Puck represents the views of, for example, ex-president Teddy Roosevelt. If you come here, lose the old identity, be an American, which meant, of course, mostly adopting white New England culture. A multicultural mosaic celebrates hyphenateds. Bring your cultures here. Contribute your pieces to the ever-changing mosaic. Canadians prefer the mosaic metaphor. In fact, that metaphor is written into its laws and the way it distributes tax dollars to sustain different cultural groups. In 1938, Scottish-Canadian writer John Murray Gibbon described Canada's developing multicultural society as a cultural mosaic to differentiate it from the perceived melting pot of the U.S. Gibbon writes, he first found the metaphor in a mosaic, in, uh, of a mosaic used in the early 1920s once by a Canadian and once by an American visiting Canada and commenting on Canada's culture. Gibbon uses some now outdated language, outdated language, referring to immigrant populations from Europe, the only population he studied, by the way, as different races. I am familiar with that wording uh, from having read about Northern Italians were said to be of a more developed and refined race than Southern Italians. Gibbon details the geographics from different nationalities came and how those geographical differences affected the worldviews of those immigrants. The book also focuses on the cultures of the immigrants, language groups, clothes, music, festivals, foods. Here's a few words about how he describes the mosaic. The Canadian people today presents itself uh, has a decorated surface, bright with inlays of separate colored pieces, not painted in colors blended with brush and palette, the original background in which the inlays are set is still visible, but these inlays cover more space than that background, and so the ensemble may truly be called a mosaic. Now, hear his hope that there is maybe an artist even behind creating the pattern in the mosaic, where he says, whether time the artist will ever design and create a masterpiece out of the Canadian scene remains for a mythical judge in some remote future to decide. All we can do today is to collect and separate and perhaps ourselves fabricate the tesserae or little slabs of color required for what the artist seems to have in mind as a mosaic. Gibbon also offers comments on the cement in our terms for this class, the oneness that binds the mosaic together. His ingredients do not surprise. Churches offering social services, voluntary organizations, wars that required a unified national response, the YM and YWCAs, common places of employment, cultural outreach from many of the groups to other groups, such as choirs and dance demonstrations, and wait for it, Canadian schools. 
of schools given rights the finest and strongest cement for the Canadian mosaic is the training provided in Canadian schools. This catches the children, the newcomers, when their minds readily accept the life and thought of the country where their parents have chosen for their home. Hmm, public schools, a cement for a national mosaic. That's a concept. The Canadian Multicultural Act of 1985 actually inscribed multiculturalism into the law. The law, the act stated that part of the government is Canada's policy is to recognize and promote the understanding that multiculturalism reflects the cultural and racial diversity of Canadian society and acknowledges the freedom of all members of Canadian society to preserve, enhance, and share their cultural heritage. So the mosaic metaphor tells the story of a manyness that's joined in a world of a work of art in which the manyness is preserved, enhanced, and shared. Apparently that metaphor could, could apply to the First Nations. But the complication of including the First Nations is that the mosaic was created at their expense. And while the metaphor connotes a work of beauty, the destruction of First Nations peoples, lands, cultures, especially in residential schools, begs the question of what to do with the ugliness that's also been part of the mosaic. Of course, a similar situation exists in the U.S. Another image or metaphor is a city of neighborhoods or a city park. Yasha Monk has been attentive to the relationship of the one and the many within democracies. He's the author whose writing encouraged me to look closely at the melting pot play and metaphor. Well, here's an excerpt from an interview Monk gave regarding the perspective that a city park is a good metaphor for the one and the many. After talking about Zengmul and the melting pot, uh, Monk goes on to say, the alternative version, the alternative metaphor that people have often embrace is that of a salad bowl or mosaic. Here are a few different ways of putting it. But the basic idea there is you create a society which is really more an association of associations. Being American is never going to have any real meaning. You're just going to be an Irish American or Hispanic or an African American or Muslim American. And really the fundamental thing about you is you're belonging to a particular identity group and the most extreme we don't conceive of people anymore in terms of individual rights and responsibilities, but just as members of groups that have particular rights and privileges, and your life is really going to be defined in the way it is today in Lebanon, for example, by your membership in one of those groups. So anybody who hopes to sustain some form of common American culture, some form of commonality across these groups is actually a sort of bigot. Or someone who you know is, is, is like one of the melting pot people who isn't comfortable with any kind of real diversity. And I think this is also a mistake because historically we see that in many societies where people fail to find any kind of shared national identity, you're not able to sustain public goods, welfare state, public spending. You're not able to sustain a meaningful solidarity with each other and you often have conflicts even civil war. So I think this idea of just giving up on any kind of commonality is wrong as well. And so one of the metaphors that I use in the book, he says, is that of a public park, which is a thing helpful because a park is a place where I can go and be among my own group. I can go with a bunch of people who arrive in the park with and we can stay among ourselves, but it's also a place of encounter. It can also be a place in which kids from one group and kids from another group end up playing together or playing soccer together, in which people actually make connections that go beyond what they brought to the park with them. And so for me, I think that this is the kind of society we should be aiming for, one in which people have the right and do in fact celebrate what's specific about their heritage, about their culture in which there's something meaningful to your who your ancestors are, and you can continue to sustain those relations and traditions and so far as you wish and, and choose, but in which nevertheless, there's also more rather than less contact between members of these different groups, more rather than less friendship between the members of those different groups, rather than just those communities that coexist alongside each other with no meaningful interactions, you know, for the foreseeable future. Now, 
Playing out these metaphors a little more with the metaphor's consequences for story, belonging, moral order, and empowerment with affinity for the metaphor it comes up with then, uh, what is this story with affinities for the body of Christ, perhaps how a nation came to be, a uh, bundle of sticks, S stay close for strength in challenging times, the bouquet, we're even more lovely together than apart, the smelting or melting pot, old world debts must be burned away. Mosaic, we retain and contribute our individual beauty, the whole and city park, one park, many low cipher diverse activities. What's the meaning of who belongs with affinities for the body of Christ? It's for Christians. <laughs> the bundle of sticks means we are in this together. The bouquet includes anyone with beauty to contribute. The smelting pot, it's comprised of persons willing to be subjected to smelting out the old hatreds. Mosaic, you know, might beg the question of who do I fit, how do I fit in this pattern? City Park is open to persons willing to play with others by the park rules. What is the moral order with affinities for the, well, the body of Christ? Well, that'd be a Christian moral code, but of course, that which kind of Christian are we talking about? That bundle of sticks were obligated to stand with others in tough times. The bouquet, members must recognize the contribution of each to making the whole. And the smelting pot, required tough individual work. One must remove the beam from your own eye first before going after your neighbor. Mosaic, this pattern represent a just arrangement and distribution of the colors. City park, play by the rules, clean up your messes, Leave the park better than you found it. And what is the sense to, of what must be overcome with affinities for the body of Christ? Well, that's sin and grace. Sin to, must be overcome. That bundle of sticks, the inclination is to separate, to break up into our different tribes. The bouquet, oh, you've heard that phrase, you can't soar with the eagles when you work with turkeys. If you denigrate the other as inferior, it messes up the bouquet. The melting pot, perhaps the avoidance of the behavior of, well, I'm not the one who needs to change. You need self-awareness and virtues. And the mosaic, you've used too many yellow pieces, not enough purple. What's a just way again to set the pattern? City park, I make my own rules, can't tell me what to do. To play in the park though, you must cultivate both personal and social responsibility. So, what do you think of the metaphors of a bundle of sticks, a bouquet, melting pot, mosaic, and city park as we talk about the one and the many? Let's talk on Thursday, and before then, if you wish, on Mighty Networks.